Hi, Damon. Hi, Bob. How you doing? Good. Good to be here. Good to have you here. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available in both streaming video and as an audio podcast. Um, you're Damon Linker. You write for the week. Uh, would you like to plug a book or two? Uh, well, I've written two books, The Theocons and The Religious Test. Uh, nothing that recently, though, uh, but uh, they're still available. Never, and too late, still never too late to buy a book. Never yeah. too late for enlightenment. So we're going to talk about international law. You wrote a column that, uh, well, was not altogether rosy uh, in its conception of the prospects for international law. I wouldn't say it's not quite that you're against the idea. You just think it's hopeless. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I, I'm more of, of what's usually described as a realist in foreign policy, which has a somewhat technical meaning, meaning that I think that states behave the way they do based mainly on power relations and their assessments of their own interests. Mm -hmm. And that uh, international law is the attempt to kind of moralize this relationship by uh, sort of uh, creating an overlay of legality over this interaction mm -hmm. uh, and that uh, we can talk uh, somewhat about why I, I think this right. is a problem, I mean, but that's this, sort of this is funny the because, way, at least to a realist, is how it works. Okay, this is funny because I'm a big supporter of international law. I realize it has a ways to go in its evolution and in, and in the evolution of our uh, respect for it, but... Um, but I think it's the only hope. I mean, I think if we don't start taking it seriously along, uh, you know, along various dimensions, things can get bad. And yet I am a realist myself. I am a progressive realist, but uh, I am, I, uh, you know, I consider myself a realist. And by the way, here's a little, uh, what may be a surprise for you. You probably know that Hans Morgenthau is one of the architects of realism. He wrote a book called Politics Among Nations. It's kind of a Bible of realism. In that book, it says... The day may come when it makes sense for a realist to support world government. He says that. Mm -hmm. the circumstance, I forget what the context is, whether he's talking about technological evolution. I would certainly argue that technological change is one thing that makes it uh, more and more necessary. But in any event, with that as the, the like deep philosophical backdrop, why don't we talk about the uh, events that led you to opine on the hopelessness of international law, and then I will give you pushback. And the 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 event in particular was the uh, the Syria, the uh, what apparently, although it hasn't been entirely confirmed as far as I know, apparently was a chemical weapons attack perpetrated by the Assad regime. I'm guessing it probably was that. I just haven't haven't seen the actual evidence. Um, and then the, the retaliation or punishment uh, that the United States and a couple of allies took it upon themselves to. Uh, to inflict, why don't you tell us how you think this illustrates the problem with, or a problem with international law? Right. Well, I think there are a, a few problems, and, and this does illustrate one of them pretty well, and it's one that I've written about actually uh, an awful lot in the context of uh, arguments on the right in favor of the Iraq war, especially by conservative Catholic writers like uh, George Weigel is an example uh, of someone who makes these kinds of arguments that are based in kind of just war theory. And they are now just war theory, like international law, clearly has had some very good effects, I think, especially about how at least most nations of the world, the, the advanced industrialized nations of the world, how they conduct themselves within the context of a war that we try to avoid civilian casualties as much as we can, uh, that we try to be proportionate in our use of military force and retaliation for acts against us and so forth. So that clearly is a good. The problem is that both just war theory, at least as these conservative writers think about it, as well as international law, which is often invoked a little more often by liberal internationalists, both of these camps share this view that international law and just war can be used to justify military kind of positive arguments in favor of military action. And my problem with this is that it is too often use exactly that to kind of give a not just a green light but a kind of moral promoter 
to acts of military uh, aggression against other states in the name of punishing uh, us they taken. And so in that sense, I don't really see international law kind of increasing the peace unless you assume this kind of dialectical Wilsonian view of world history where, well, yes, we'll have, a, we'll have another little war, but it'll be another step toward a world with no war. Because Wilson is, is, is very famous for describing uh, World War I as this war to end. And, all. and this has been kind of the dream animating uh, international law from the beginning, that somehow from out of the present morass of war, we can somehow have uh, a battle or another war, another conflict that uh, will ultimately result in a world that doesn't have war. Um, that end goal is somewhat far out on the horizon. And uh, again, my problem with this way of it in the near term, it always seems to give a justification for an attack in the name of the noblest of motives. Uh, my own, my own. Before I, I stop for a second, I mean, my own kind of sort of distinctive take on this. I haven't heard a lot of people make this argument before. Is that you know, people on the left especially love to bash Bush. You know, he lied us into war. They wanted the oil. There's always a kind of nefarious lower motive underneath the high noble moral rhetoric. I actually think that in many cases these wars are undertaken by people with good intentions. My problem actually is that our foreign policy is too moralistic, too inclined to to kind of uh, drape a cloth of, of kind of moral do-good intent uh, over our acts, which very often involve killing people and blowing things up. Okay. Okay, so first I would encourage us to just separate out just war theory and everything else. That's just like moralizing. I mean, that's not it. That, that, that is not unrelated to international law, but I mean, international law has in some sense a firmer foundation than like what a bunch of philosophers may have said. Specifically, treaties, agreements between nations. The United Nations was formed via treaty. We signed, so there are written commitments made by nations that are members to the United Nations, and failing to abide by them is a violation of international law. There are other agreements as well, other treaties, failing to abide by those uh, is a violation. So there's something a little firmer to talk about here. And that allows us to say uh, that, um, you know, you said, well, often, um, Wars are started in the name of international law. Well, to, in the name of enforcing international law. Yeah, but those, those wars fall into two categories. The kind that are themselves legal because they, 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 they comply with the United Nations Treaty and the kind that are illegal. So what the United Nations did in Iraq and just now in Syria, that's just illegal. That's a violation of international law. You know, and just, I know in your piece, you, you spend a lot of time on the paradox uh, of kind of, wait a second, on the one hand, we say we're enforcing international law, but then people say the way we enforce it is a violation of international law. Here's the analogy I would draw. If I said to you, you know, Damon, this whole thing, this idea of the United States having laws that govern its citizens, it just doesn't work, because let me tell you what just happened. My neighbor had a meth lab, and that's illegal. And I, I got my gun, I broke down the door, I locked him in a closet, and I called the police and said, I found a meth lab. And you know what the police did? They came and arrested me. They said what I had done was illegal. Well, okay, what I had done was illegal. It's not a legal, it's not legal for an individual citizen to take it into their own hands to enforce the law by breaking down a door without a search warrant. And what the United States did, uh, although Syria apparently had violated international law, and again, I want to emphasize that, that if, if indeed Assad did this thing with the chemical weapons, it's a clear-cut violation because if for no other reason, Syria is a party to the Chemical Weapons Convention, okay? So clear-cut violation if indeed what we think happened happened. Um, and, and so there can be uh, uh, forceful action taken to punish Syria, but just as there is a legal mechanism for enforcing domestic law, you have to get a warrant and so on, there is a legal mechanism uh, in the case of international law. You have to go through the UN Security Council. 
and some wars have been uh, authorized by the UN Security Council. Persian Gulf War, first Iraq War was, and by the way, the other difference between that and, and the uh, second Iraq War was, uh, it was, it was initiated by a clear-cut violation of international law on Iraq's part, transborder aggression. That's what the UN was set up to solve above all else, in a way, to stop is transborder aggression. There have been other such cases. Well, well the, Persian Gulf War is, the, the Persian Gulf War is clearly the best, strongest case for, I think, your position on international law. That, right. that was a case where, yeah, it was authorized by the Security Council. The U.S. president kind of led the charge, but he, he formed the broadest possible coalition of nations to get, the, to get together and say, you agree Iraq did, was wrong? Yeah, you do too. We all, community of nations, are getting together, and we're all on the same page about this, right? And I would actually say that that, is a sufficiently high bar that if it always could be met would be a very strong case for your position on international law because that is approaching something like world government as you mentioned Hans Morgenthau talking about I mean it's still at a very primitive stage but mm -hmm. I think that it's it's at least it's in that direction of toward legitimacy. So I'll grant you that. Absolutely. OK, well, I'd say not only kind of the direction. In fact, I wouldn't I don't want to use the word legitimate. I mean, Anne Marie Slaughter uh, in the run up to the Iraq war said, OK, granted, an invasion is illegal under international law, but it's legitimate. No, legitimacy is just too fuzzy for me. I mean, international law can be a firm thing that we talk about in clear terms. And by the way, the, 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 uh, the one thing you said you know, we got the broadest co possible coalition to help in the evasion. That doesn't matter. Here's the key thing. The UN Security Council authorized the use of force, period. That's like getting a warrant from a judge. And, and in fact, although um, the, the, this was a very clear-cut case of Iraq having itself violated international law, the UN Security has uh, a certain amount of leeway in defining, you know, there, there's a famous clause in the UN Charter saying it's something like uh, it can intervene or authorize intervention for the sake of uh, securing international peace and order or something. That's a very broad mandate. And, and so in that sense, and this is, I can imagine someone complaining about this saying, wait, you're saying the, the, the law is what the UN Security Council says it is? Yeah, in a certain sense, yeah. On the other hand, it's actually pretty hard to get because there are five members that have a permanent veto. It's actually pretty hard to get the UN Security Council to, uh, to commit to the use of force. It's happened a few times. Our invasion of, of Afghanistan was authorized by, the, you know, China and Russia were on board. Uh, uh, the Bosnian intervention was authorized by the Security Council. Technically, that had involved transborder aggression, so there was a, a pretty clear-cut pretext even aside from all the horrible things they were doing in Bosnia. So, um, you know, th there are... Uh, there are a lot of problems. As you said, we're in a primitive state of evolution. And people, all, people often get frustrated with, uh, like, when they can't get the UN Security Council to authorize the wars they want authorized. And I grant you that it's a much more kind of dodgy and fluky process than, say, getting a warrant when our court system is functioning as it should, although it hasn't always functioned as it should. I mean, there are shortcomings there. But, but I grant you that that's a problem. But I would say one thing. on balance. If we had respected the Security Council and just invaded when they say it's okay and not invaded when they didn't, we'd be in a much better position because we wouldn't have done the Iraq War. And the Libya thing is interesting because they authorized the intervention to protect the population that seemed threatened. But by most readings of it, although there is some loose language in it, by most readings of it, when we switched when we went on to regime change, we had exceeded the mandate of the UN Security Council. And the Russians were not at all happy about that. Mm -hmm. So I would say uh, if we had respected uh, the UN Security Council consistently, as imperfect as it is, and, and as much as it may fail sometimes to authorize punishment that is warranted, we would be in a much, much better position.
Well, in in some cases, I think that's true, and that's mainly because I believe in a foreign policy of restraint, and certainly much more restrained than is typical for the United States. But I tend to couch those arguments in terms of our national interest rather than obedience to international norms and laws. Um, so I guess we arrive at similar positions from different uh, starting points. But for me, the the issue has to do with what international law is. And I'm very glad that you made the analogy uh, a few times to the laws of the United States, because that really does have to be the analogy. And I spent some time in the column you're talking about uh, kind of hopping back and forth to the two sides of this analogy. And that really is, for me, where the problem lies, that in liberal democratic forms of government like our own, we have certain standards of what counts as a legitimate law. You have to have consent of the governed, at least, uh, you know, maybe not every individual consenting anew as soon as they come to consciousness, but there's a kind of tacit consent by the people who live there, meaning that if they cease consenting, they can legitimately overthrow the government if they want. Um, that there's a kind of democratic accountability through election, through uh, having representatives who you believe actually understand your interest and will represent you when they make those laws, and then that the punishment is enacted by a judiciary that is free and independent and has its own kind of base of support in the society and, and stands up for the law, supposedly apart from more narrow political considerations. All of these things are matter. The problem is that those criteria can only be uh, met at the international level, level if we already had a legitimate world government. Only in such, such conditions could you make legitimate laws that are binding morally on all members of the human race who are supposedly under uh, international law. And to the extent that we are trying uh, another analogy in the same way that the EU is sort of trying to turn itself into a not world government, but certainly kind of regional continent wide government um, without there being such a political community in existence yet. They're kind of reaching beyond to have something more than the individual nations that comprise it. Um, we are always going to run into this situation where, where we're saying that there are laws that are binding on the people of the world, and yet the people of the world do not authorize them legitimately. That makes them fundamentally undemocratic. Now, they might be liberal. There's a difference between liberal and democratic. Um, yeah. The United Nations consists entirely of nations that agreed to be part of the United Nations. They signed on to these things. It is, it is uh, it's not, you can say there, there are senses in which it's not a perfect democracy of nations, and that's certainly true, but, but it, this is not, no, membership on the UN is not being imposed on any nation, and the membership entailed an agreement that if you commit transborder aggression, for example, you're in trouble. Yeah, that's a no-no, and the other members will unite against you. So there is, th this is, uh, to the extent this is government, and by the way, I never champion world government because, uh, I mean, I think the most we can hope for uh, is something that you might call world governance, something more fluid and decentralized than anything that the word government connotes, but um, uh, but, but this is not, it's, it's not being imposed on anyone. They join, they can leave, I think. I don't know what the mechanism is for leaving, but every every treaty uh, I'm aware of, uh, uh, has an exit ramp. Sure. I mean, I, I'm fully in favor of treaties and other bilateral and even multilateral agreements among nations. The difference is international law is supposed to be a body of laws that are somehow above and apart from the signatory nations within the United Nations. And yes, technically, uh, if 50 years ago a nation joined the the uh, UN and it's therefore, you know, you can say to them just as you say to an American, well, you've consented, you're here, you're in already, you got to abide by it. But, but the problem, don't you see that even in the United States, we have problems where people don't feel like they're adequately represented by our 535 representatives in Congress. 
And that's because in the House, it's, I forget the exact number, it's something like 800,000 people get one representative. Uh, and then if you're in a state and you're talking about the Senate and you're in California, you're basically, it's, it's two people for 30 million who are getting represented in the, in the Senate. And, mm -hmm. and it, that's in California and it varies from state to state, of course, but that's, that's pretty minimal representation. Now you're talking about at a higher level, your entire nation has its one consent by joining the United Nations and all the, the body of international laws being created at this meta level is somehow binding on you at this point to even including another country 5,000 miles away from you launching Tomahawk missiles at you in the middle of your own civil war. I just find this well, wait, no, but that was illegal. I'm trying to tell you, Damon, that was illegal. What we, I'm serious. This is an important point. I mean, you're very caught up on this paradox of, wait, these people invoked uh, international law to violate international law. Well, yeah, just like if I, if I break down the door of my neighbor's house because he has a meth lab, I'm invoking the law, but what I did is illegal. So it's not a sufficient indictment. You're not indicting international law by saying the strike against Syria was ill-advised or whatever. What you're indicting is America's failure to respect international law, which it does repeatedly. We are a total outlaw nation. You know, we pay virtually no consistent attention to international law. And we're not the only outlaw nation, but we are one of the most egregious violators of international law. So I want to make that distinction. But and when we violate it, we often do so in the name of international law. Well, actually, if there's an international law, we can find it. I didn't I didn't hear the Trump administration just didn't get into international law. They didn't. They, no, they, they, they didn't. They claimed That's true. That it was they claimed that it was a justified use of force under the U.S. Constitution. In other words, that Trump was justified in not going to Congress. That's a totally separate matter. I think they recognize that they didn't have a, a leg to stand on. In the past, they have, even the, even the Trump administration has in the past justified some things they've done in terms of international law. If they can it, figure out a way to do it. I mean, the Bush administration can try to judge in Iraq by, by referring to the violated UN uh, right. rulings throughout these about Saddam developing weapons in the no-fly zone and so on. Right, but, it, but it's bullshit. Kofi Annan himself, Secretary General of the UN, said flat out, this was illegal. Mm -hmm. and, and Bush, the Bush, and it's true, administrations strain and they, and, and there are genuinely fuzzy areas, but uh, there, there's not very much co uh, controversy, I don't think, among actual scholars of international law about the illegality of the Iraq invasion. Because the question isn't, was Saddam Hussein violating international law? He was doing it maybe on the margins at that point. The question is whether the intervention itself was warranted under international law. Right, but there's a second issue that is more interesting to me. I know that, that according to the, con the Chemical Weapons Convention, that Syria, if it in fact did use chemical weapons a few weeks ago, violated it. Mm -hmm. The problem is that when your neighbor uh, has a meth lab, the cops need to get a warrant from some authority, a judge who is apparently either elected or appointed according to other laws and norms that we have in this country. And the judge will authorize the warrant. Then the cops can go in and look to see if there is a meth lab and if there is, can arrest the person and their procedures. And you bring that person before a court and you can hold them only for a certain amount of time without arraigning them. And then... There's a trial, there's appeals and juries and all of this stuff. None of that really exists. There's the UN and international law, but then who's authorized to punish? How much punishment? In under what conditions? What's what's an acceptable amount of punishment? What's proportional? We sometimes take it upon ourselves if it if it meshes with our interests to say that's what we're doing. But usually we would have done it anyway because we want to for whatever reason. Well, maybe, but um, that's illegal. I, I mean, you're, the answer to your question, who does the authorizing? Again, the United Nations Security Council. Now, we have a veto and four other nations do. And that's why, if anything, it probably under responds to things. I mean, the, the, the Security Council itself. And, 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 and that is... There's certainly plenty of contrast between it and the mechanism for enforcing domestic law, as you note. On the other hand, domestic law wasn't always what it was. 
it evolved from primordial times to where it is now, even in America's fairly, re even in the history of America, there were times when frontier justice ruled, and I don't know exactly what the process was by which that changed, but I'm sure there were intermediate stages where it wasn't the system you just described. And by the way, uh, the system uh, isn't perfect now. There are places where politics prevails and bad things happen. But but the answer to your question, well, who who will do what judges and cops, you know, do? I mean, there there are answers. The UN Security Council under the UN Charter is the one body that is that is there to authorize the use of force. But the, uh, yeah, technically that is the case. The question is, what is the character of that? body what kind of a government is this this rudimentary world government we have seated in the un and i simply i i simply don't see it as being in any way something that we would recognize as democratic it is again liberal in that these are liberal norms of procedures the, but the, the problem is that liberalism and democracy can get disattached and the more liberal and undemocratic we have in, in a political system, then the more you are able to get people in the name of democracy to oppose it. And you hear this within nations who claim in the name of like self-determination that, well, hey, we're, we're having a civil war here. It's an extreme case. And to, to keep our country together, we have to do X, Y, and Z. I'm kind of making a very, very loose pro-Assad argument there. Not that I personally have any uh, sympathy for Assad, but I do have some sympathy for an anal another analogy that I've drawn in other columns, actually. I wrote a similar column, not so much about international law, but making a similar argument about an almost exactly one year ago attack that we launched against Assad after the last right. uh, chemical weapons attack. It's interesting how they were almost to the day, the same date, mm -hmm. two years in a row. But my, my analogy that I made there was about our civil war. Like, we engaged in a horrible civil war, terrible right. bloodletting. 600,000 or more people died in that mm -hmm. war. How would we have felt? And it is a matter of how would we feel because this is a, this is a self-determination argument. Yeah. If at that point, say in 1863 or 4, some foreign power 5,000 miles away said, you people have violated these extra political norms that exist out here in the international order, and we are therefore going to launch weapons at you to ensure that you don't do it anymore because we don't like how you're fighting amongst each other. Well, again, if, if we did what I recommend, respect international law, we would not have done what you oppose. Okay? The, the missile strikes were illegal. Okay, I, I don't know how many times, you know... This is not, you're not making an argument against international law. You're making an argument against the failure to respect it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I suppose. I, I suppose. But there, I mean, there are, st but you've also made the argument that Assad, if he launched chemical weapons, violated international law. So well, right. you but said sometimes he violated it's international law and attempting to punish a violator of international law. Right. Okay. Right. It's paradoxical, and it's paradoxical that my neighbor may be doing something illegal, but I, they just can't get the search warrant. That happens. You know, crimes go un, unprosecuted because there's not enough, there's not probable cause. Or whatever. So there's imperfections, um, but, uh, but you know, the, the, I, I want to emphasize, I mean, first of all, I share your, your disposition <laughs> toward uh, non-intervention. I was against the Iraq War before it was cool, which is to say before the invasion. Me it's, too. You too. You and, you and me and like three other people. Right. And I want to emphasize, you know, uh, one thing about um, international law, as, especially in its traditional, especially in the, in the initial incarnation of the United Nations is there was a big emphasis on the respect for national sovereignty. There wasn't stuff in there about intervening in civil wars. Mm -hmm. and, and by the way, on Syria, my, my personal opinion is that the most underappreciated thing about the Syrian civil war is that there's a pretty good chance that had we and our allies not flooded that place with weapons in support of the rebels, Assad would have suppressed the insurrection in admittedly brutal fa uh, fashion. Innocent people would have died, but many fewer innocent people would have died and many fewer refugees and we would be in a better place. And I just want to emphasize, 
that if anything, you could argue that what we did was a violation of international law there. We were infringing on national sovereignty. We were sending weapons in. We were supporting, you know, so I, I don't really know. I shouldn't speak for that. I don't know about what the legalities are, but I do want to emphasize uh, the UN, the big emphasis at the creation of the UN was on what they wanted to stop was trans-border aggression. The idea was that within your borders, you know, it's a very realist, it's a very realist institution, uh, both in the sense that it, it, it respected national sovereignty and said what you do within your borders is more or less your business. There are extremes you could go to maybe that would, uh, that would allow the Security Council to invoke some fuzzy language to do something. But by and large, it was like, as long as you don't commit trans-border aggression, we have no business meddling. And, and the use of punitive force is pretty much totally about people who violate uh, the, the law against trans-border aggression. And I just want to, on this note, say one more thing and I'll shut up, which is you said, you know, I'm for national interest uh, as opposed to like whatever you're calling the UN world government, uh, international law. Well, I want to emphasize you would probably agree that there are times when it makes sense to join an alliance out of national interest, right? Like maybe NATO during the Cold War, if, if, if indeed the communist threat was as big a threat as we thought, I, I, I think in retrospect it wasn't, but whatever. Uh, maybe it makes sense to pool our sovereignty in some sense. We commit to defend those nations if they're attacked, they defend to help us if we're attacked. That's what the UN Charter is. It's a document oh. of collective security. It says we're all agreeing that if any one of us is attacked, including by a member of the UN, we will all band together. So the logic is the logic of uh, self-interest, of national self-interest. The argument is it's in your interest to join this collective security apparatus. Well, in that, that we'll call that UN 1.0. Uh, right. Right. That definition of it, I can I can get behind more than what I would call UN 2.0, which is kind of from the mid 70s or early 70s uh, kind of human rights revolution onward, which is where you get the rise of liberal internationalism on the center left and then neoconservatism on the center right, both of which have this more robust notion that actually kind of I remember uh, you know we we. He used to first thing I used to be an editor and became a, a strong critic of the magazine. Uh, you know, George Weigel published a lot of essays in wait, favor this was, of the Iraq uh, War. Wait, this is which magazine again? First it, things. First things, right, right. Yeah, I mean, he uh, George Weigel published a lot of pieces in our pages, making uh, the case in favor of invading Iraq in two thousand and three uh, with the Bush administration in terms of. We're defending, uh, we're defending the rights of the Kurds and, and the Shiites in the South against this evil dictator. We're enforcing the uh, UN resolutions after the first Gulf War. All of these kind of uh, arguments couched in, in more and, and international are these violations, and we have to enforce them against the Kafalian uh, you know, chaos of 200 nations all uh, out for their own. If you can make a case in the UN 1.0 uh, position in favor of a being in our self-interest to kind of have a club where we get together and kind of be, all right, none of us are going to attack each other, and if one of us does, the rest of us will band together and defend you, that could you could come up with a kind of rational basis for joining such an organization. Once you get the second-order overlay of, you know, Anne-Marie Slaughter, great person, very smart in a lot of ways, but what you said she said about the Iraq war in 2003, she said again after the Trump administration's attack on Syria two, two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. She said exactly the same thing on Twitter. Like, well, this is against international law, but I'm glad it happened because we punished this evildoer. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, Assad, that was a paraphrase, of course, but... But, you know, I use of evildoer deliberately, that there is this overlap on the center right and center left, this notion that we're the policemen of the world and the judge and the jury and the executioner, not consistently, you know, not in Myanmar, uh, not not in, you know, areas uh, in Africa below a certain parallel right. when it's no longer folded into the war on terror. But within that scope of our interests that we can define in these moral terms, then we will will selectively the evildoers.
That, I think, when it's done in the name of whether it's just war or in international laws, is pernicious. It, it gives a green Absolutely. light to more, more war. Yeah, but, but Anne, again, Anne-Marie Slaughter was explicitly not doing it in the name of international law. And that's a tribute to her intellect. At least she wasn't confused. Anyone yeah. who does justify what we did in Syria in the name of international law, who thinks we were on the side of international law, uh, and, and, and what we did was consistent with international law, it's just confused. Well, I mean, okay, I, I grant your point. It's like the person whose neighbor is committing a crime and doesn't get a right. search warrant and takes it into his own hands. And let's just say, based on the history of, of the United States, no surprise that we like vigilante justice. Right. <laughs> so, you know, history of this. now I should acknowledge that, I mean, on this issue of kind of UN 2.0, there has been... Uh, some evolution beyond the, uh, well, I, I mean, here it gets kind of fuzzy. I mean, one of the biggest development, I mean, there's been a lot of things. There's, there's uh, first of all, there is the Chemical Weapons Convention. That happened in the 90s. So, so those kinds right. of things have happened. There's, uh, and, and I think those kinds of things, it is important to have those things and have a way to enforce them. And I think it's much more urgent and important in the case of biological weapons because they're much more potentially uh, catastrophic. But um, there's been that thing. And, but then you're, you're right that uh, with the, uh, as a result of kind of, you know, concern, uh, understandable concern for human rights, uh, the development of human rights lobbies and so on, there have been developments. One of the most important doctrines is the so-called right to protect. Right. Now, the status of that in international law is... Uh, I just tried to brush up on it before we started taping, and I didn't didn't finish. But um, let me just say that that would not justify what we did, but uh, because to the extent that anyone, I'm not even sure the Security Council would be allowed to invoke it in authorizing intervention. I think that the Security Council now the Security Council can always authorize intervention if it wants, because there is that broad phase for the sake of international peace and stability, or whatever the term is. Um, but I'm not. Right to protect, it, it does not have the status that, like, uh, the, trans, the, 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 the sanction against transborder aggression has in the UN, the formal structure of UN law. But, and, and I should also say there's something called customary law such that, I don't know, it's like even though we are not haven't signed the law of the sea treaty, some people might argue that because of customary law, because so many people are respecting it, something or other happens. There's all these gray areas I'm not that familiar with. And I myself am skeptical of mission creep on the part of the UN. I think uh, the, uh, I, I really, you know, I think there's a case to be made for respecting the sovereignty of nations except under extraordinary circumstances. I think we'll all, we, we'd all agree if, if, a, if something like the Holocaust was going on, well, all bets are off. And I, I wouldn't wait for the Security Council to intervene, you know, but, but I think, uh, you know, as a, as a, um, as a rule, well, we agree. The UN has just been much too casual about violating uh, so sovereignty of other nations. And, and we are, I just want to emphasize, we're, international law is on our side, as I understand it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's, uh, it, it's, it's that issue combined with what that does then to the perceived legitimacy of of the of the United States, of the West, of the UN as an institution, and uh, I just find that it doesn't clarify things to have this kind of uh, get out of jail free card or a kind of uh, kind of bu button that turns the light green whenever you want it to. We don't uh, have one. Kind of give, well, but there are a lot of people who think we do, and they that's the ambiguity. <laughs> Spend your time clarifying the world their is thought. People. <laughs> Spend your time clarifying their thought. I mean, you know, and, and in fact, the security, I, I said it was, a, UN was in some ways a realist institution, also in the sense that uh, FDR, you know, they put the hands in the, uh, they put the power in the hands of the powerful nations. Now that it's changed a little what the powerful nations is, but after the war, you know, England, France, America, China, and Russia those were some of the big uh, powers, in some cases, recovering powers. And the idea was, if any of them objects to the use of force, then the use of force is not authorized. That, that's, in, that's a fairly conservative uh, approach mm -hmm. to authorizing the use of force. 
Right. Trouble is, we don't pay any attention to it. True enough. True enough. But it's also true that when you when you make a law that it's illegal to have a meth lab in your house, and if the laws are written in such a way that it's impossible or close to impossible to getting a search warrant, you're going to get vigilantes because you've declared it illegal. So the problem, I mean, that's kind of, I guess, a, an analogical way of getting at what I, I see your me point. about all of this. So that's an interesting argument. I personally uh, don't think it has, uh, I don't think it's because, well, I mean, okay, did, did the people who wanted to attack Syria, did they make use of the uh, legal status of it? Uh, of, of the use of chemical weapons, which is absolutely. In, I mean, without that, they, they did make rhetorical use of no authors at all, and it's and it's also an absurdly and it's also an absurdly uh, arbitrary one. We can agree, maybe not, but that's a problem with the law. I mean, why? So, oh, as I quote, uh, a, a, a scholar at the uh, Cato Institute had a, a nice uh, pithy tweet that I quote in the column, uh, saying, you know. Well, why Syria, but not Myanmar? Why, why chemical weapons, but not barrel bombs? I mean, so, so Assad says, oh, I killed 40 people with chemical weapons. All right, I'll go back to killing them, you know, mm. several dozen at a time as I have for, ye for like seven years now. It's, it's just... Yeah, I, I mean, that said, I, I'd say one thing I'd say in, in, in defense of the Chemical Weapons Convention and the norm against use chemical weapons is, first of all, it's true that there are more and less horrific ways to die, and apparently chemical weapons can be a really horrific way to die, and in some cases you don't die, but it's a horrific life you have. have you? And, and the other thing I'd say is, if it weren't for the norm and the law against it, you might see much more use of uh, chemical weapons, in which case there would be more... Uh, more human suffering than there would be if they were killed more conventionally. That said, I take your point. It's like, I take your point it, it, that, that um, or to look at it the other way, you know, when people try to act like barrel bombs, I mean, there was an attempt to almost put barrel bombs in to, to in a way, comply with the logic, I guess you'd, you'd like in a certain sense, but to say barrel bomb, bombs, that's barbaric. I never understood, like, what's the huge difference? I mean, bombs that kill and maim are bombs that kill and maim. I'm against yeah, the bomb. I agree. In both cases. I, I just brought it up because you hear a lot of people talking about yeah. barrel bombs as being unique. But I, my yeah. point is simply that that something like 400, 500,000 people have died in the yeah. Civil War. We can't even come close to getting an accurate estimate because it's just such a mess. It's, it's, it's a travesty. It's terrible. But... Right. Why chemical weapons? Well, well, why is it okay? I mean, and I don't actually, I mean, I'm sure it's terrible to survive a chemical weapons attack and have your lungs fried and you can't breathe and you're, you're in pain yeah. and it burns all over the place. But, you know, getting your legs blown off or your arm blown off or your, you know, it, it's all pretty bad. Yeah. No, <laughs> it's I, I, really bad in the American Civil War I, to have chunks of your body uh, blown off by little pellets of lead. Um, it's, I it's agree. Terrible. I mean, I would say, though, that um, as for how important the the illegality of chemical weapons was, uh, it may have been important, but, but I would emphasize that. It was something uh, that was just kind of convenient from the point of view of a lot of people who had their own reasons to want to attack Syria. I mean, you know, in Washington, the various interest groups at play, the various lobbies, lobbies the think tanks, and there was this additional weird political pressure where because the big suspicion about Trump is that he was in cahoots with the Russians, that means that everybody who hates Trump has to spend all their time putting political pressure on him to get tougher on the Russians. Otherwise, right. we'll suspect him of blah, blah, blah. So there was this weird uh, political dynamic emanating from uh, left of center. Not that that's the first time uh, an intervention has been supported by the left of center, but there was that too. So I kind of think, you know, there were a lot of powerful forces agitating for some kind of intervention in Syria, and there still are. It, this ain't over. Right. I know. And, and they and they would, they are going to pick up any rhetorical point they can. But but it's an interesting point you're making that maybe the illegality of chemical weapons uh, gave them some amount of ammunition. I tend to think that the ammunition itself is dwarfed by comparison with the power that this set of interests has, which includes all this 
all these. Well, but in that sense, it's it's like uh, you know people talk about presidents setting red lines, but the the the, the chem- chemical weapons convention is a permanent red line. You're not supposed to use them. It should be technically shouldn't it be superfluous for Obama to have to say if you use these, you've crossed a red line? Of course, you violated the chemical weapons treaty that you're assuming. Well, well, yeah, but since he does not have the power under international law to retaliate to to impose the punishment. He should probably give him a heads up because it wouldn't be expected in the normal course of events that one nation would violate international law in the course of enforcing uh, an international law. So, yeah, well, it, does, but, it yeah, doesn't but, go yeah. without saying that any nation can jump in. According to international law, no one nation can jump in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. Well, uh, I mean, I think we're not actually that far apart because we are both real. I know, that's because I'm converting you to my cause and before... <laughs> and, you know, I think within a week or so, you're going to be, you will be carrying around a copy of the UN Charter. Uh, the, way, the, way some patriotic, the way that, you know, that guy at the Democratic Convention carried a, around a copy of the U.S. Constitution. And, and we'll be making progress. Unlikely, but I know where you're coming from. And I do think that there's, uh, you know, again, UN 1.0 has something to be said for it. Uh, UN 2.0, I'm, I'm skeptical of. Well, one thing I certainly acknowledge is that we have a ways to go before uh, even UN 1.0 uh, is uh, consistently respected. Well, well, but it is true. I will grant you that uh, cross-border wars are far right. rarer than they used to be. Yeah. And the one big egregious exam- uh, counterexample is the invasion, Iraq's invasion of Kuwait, which we did push yeah. back under UN auspices. And, you know, that that is not such a bad thing. I mean, George H.W. Bush's vision of a new world order post Cold mm-hmm. War uh, that proceeds in that way is is, you know, not a bad idea. And no, if no. it had continued and not been undermined so much by his son. Right. Uh, it might be a little bit of a different world. No, that's right. And again, uh, for a while, it was working. I mean, the Bosnian intervention, again, technically, that, leave aside the atrocities, that was technically a violation of it was transborder aggression because. Uh, the border, the new national borders within Yugoslavia had been recognized before the Serbs headed into Bosnia. So that was technically trans, and and that was what the Security Council used. They authorized the Afghanistan invasion. In retrospect, we'd probably be better off without it. But on the other hand, it was a clear cut legal and moral case, I think, fairly. Um, And then they authorized the first part of uh, the Libya operation, the the Security Council did. And that's one place where things went sour big time, in addition to the Iraq war, which wasn't authorized. But you're right, George, the first Bush had gotten the Soviets to get into the post-Cold War spirit. And it looked for a while like like UN 1.0 was going to be a thing. Yeah. And I I think that's that's good, even though back then I was opposed to the war. But I was a silly undergrad. I was still, you know. You mean the Persian Gulf War? Yeah, Persian Gulf War, yeah. Yeah, I was not supportive either. I was arguing for something that was kind of stupid, which was just punitive airstrikes. But um, in retrospect, I mean, it just looks like a, a almost a dream of a war, right? <laughs> I mean, it does, to- although I, I'm, I've, I've gone on the record as saying the only two wars uh, in the 20th century and since that I – uh, support uh, our World War II and the Afghanistan invasion. Um, the others, I, I all think, were either Ill- morally wrong or uh, not in our interest. Oh, I supported the Bosnia intervention well before it was happening. I was an early advocate, and uh, I can live with the Persian Gulf in retrospect because, I mean, you, you, it's good when nations invade other nations to say, no, sorry, you have to go back. But yeah, I mean, of, of the ones I don't accept, that's the closest to meeting the yeah. bar. Yeah. So, again, we're not that far apart. Okay. But anyway, I, I see you, uh, you, you within, I don't know, year, year max, you're going to have a UN tattoo. Well, you know, I've changed a lot over the years, so it's possible. <laughs> you never so, know. So you leave us on a note of hope. Thank yes. you, Damon. Tell us where to find you. Your, your uh, Twitter handle is is Damon Linker, right? At Damon Linker, and uh, you can read my columns three days a week at theweek.com. And they're well worth it. i got to say, you are really a voice that uh, it's important to listen to precisely because uh, you hear a different drummer, and in a number of ways, the drummer you hear is the same same one I hear. Well, then I must be on the right track. <laughs> there, there, yeah, there is hope for you yet, is what yes. I used to say. Like, yeah. I, I mean, I might start looking into Buddhism or something. It, I was going to say that as a surprise, Damon. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Very good. All right. Well, thanks for having me on, Bob. I always enjoy it. My, my pleasure. Thank you.